right here on the Crafty Gemini YouTube channel and on the Facebook page as well. If you're new here, welcome. And if you are a returning viewer, welcome back. You already know how this works, but for those of you that are new here, we either come on Fridays and we do a live chat and a demo. I kind of catch you up on what I've been working on and what's going on in Crafty Gemini land, or we have a flash sale. And tonight we do have a flash sale for you, but it looks like we have already sold out. Um, what we have added to the website is something new where if an item that we're selling, like these flash sales, sells out, you can add yourself to the wait list on the same product page. So if you get there and it says out of stock, then obviously you know it's sold out. You can click there to add your email to the wait list. And when we restock the item, whatever it is on our website, uh, you will automatically get an email notification letting you, hey, it's been restocked. You can now go there and purchase it, right? So thank you to everybody who got in on the flash sale. Um, it looks like they're gone, but I'll go over what we had in the bundles. This is a, a little bundle that we put together. It's, uh, and it's funny because every time we do these mystery bundles, they fly. And oftentimes you hear quilters say, well, I don't really like mysteries because I kind of want to know what the fabric is that I'm getting. But I... I'm always surprised to see that so many of you love mystery bundles. So this is like an example of one. This is going to be somebody's who purchased tonight. I just pulled one. Uh, it's a stack of six different half yard cuts and the, they're all high quality, you know, designer quality quilting cottons. Let me turn my phone off here. Sorry about that. Um, uh, Designer quality quilting cotton. So just looking at these, I can tell they are like paintbrush studios, uh, art gallery fabrics, timeless treasures, art gallery fabrics, uh, timeless, and Robert Kaufman. So all the awesome brands that we know of in quilting land, right? And all the great quality quilting cottons. Uh, it's just an assortment, half yard cut. So not fat quarters, but double the amount. So it's a total of three yards that you're getting in each bundle. Then we just went ahead and threw in a, a white air erasable fabric marker. And um, this is kind of weird and kind of cool. It marks white and it's designed to be used on darker fabric. So we'll do a slight, like a little demo uh, because I'm gonna be working with some of the fabrics that I cut up earlier today for these bundles, okay? So you get that and then you always get a little uh, hand signed card by me and then a Crafty Gemini sticker. So that is what tonight's flash sale bundle is. If you missed out on it, no worries. You can add yourself to the wait list for us to restock. This is something that we can easily restock because it's a mystery bundle, right? It's not like we can't not get fabric in. There might be shipping delays, but we can still get fabric in. So no worries there. All right, so thank you everybody for tuning in. I'm coming to you from my home studio in North Central Florida where uh, the weather is nice and chilly, perfect for a fire. Now my husband has set me up here on my iPad so that I can see the chat in both or on both my Facebook page and the YouTube channel. Instead of having to pop back and forth on each, I can uh, see everybody, what everybody is chatting about. So let me say hi to a couple people I see scrolling through. Hi Carla, hey Tamara. Uh, let's see. Hi, Miss Nancy. We have Kathy tuning in from Northern Jersey. All right. So I see a lot of you are already taking advantage of writing or typing, writing. Wow. Old school. Um, typing your email address in the waitlist box on the site. So, uh, where you see the fabric bundles already sold out. So it looks like this is a popular one. So we will definitely get that restocked for y'all. Okay. Let's see. Hi, Pat. Pat Lawson is tuning in. Hi, Ray. All right, we got some friends tuning in. Charity from Missouri. Oh my gosh, I love that I can see both the Facebook and the YouTube chat at once. We got other Florida, pretty much neighbors. Miss Pat is tuning in from Georgia. Awesome. All right, so tonight, because we had cut up some of the fabric bundles, this is kind of a, a sneak peek here at some of the fabrics that may or may not be included in your uh, flash sale bundle if you got one tonight. So let's go ahead and switch to this view of my table here, and I'm going to keep on cutting. I'm working on a patchwork block. So what I'm working on is kind of a variation on a churn dash block that has pieced empty squares. I don't even know how to explain it, but when you see the visual, you'll know what I'm talking about. So I went ahead and prepped some of my squares, and I'm gonna scoot over some more here because, yeah, so that we can be a little bit more in here. So I have these two strips. I have four that measure four and seven eighths inches by four and seven eighths inches. Give me a second. I'm just going to zoom in slightly on this because I don't need to be that far away with this angle. Maybe like that. I think that'll work. 
Okay, so I have four squares, two light, two dark. If you know me, when it comes to colors, I don't even care if the colors necessarily match or if they're opposite sides on the color wheel, all that color theory. The only aspect that I really stick to is that one fabric plays as the light and one plays as the dark. So in this case, obviously the yellow, and, and this is how you can determine which one is playing as which in the combination of the two next to each other. If you put the fabrics next to each other, I ask myself, which is the light, which is the dark? If like in one second you can obviously tell this is the light and this is the dark, then I know that because I can quickly tell which is which in this fabric combination, uh, I'm gonna get a lot of color or value contrast, right? Like it's gonna pop. The dark definitely stands out next to the light and that's what I'm going for. So I grabbed a couple of these. I had this light blue fabric too, which obviously plays as the light. And it's funny because only after I held it up against this one is that I realized that this one has a light blue in it. So. Even if it didn't, I would have still used it because <laughs> I just like lights and darks together. All right. Aha, Michelle, eagle eyes, she called it. She said, new cutting mat. Dun, 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 can y'all tell? <laughs> and I'm not going to lie. Literally, as we were setting up for this, I looked at the table and told my husband, oh, I lied to them. I hadn't switched the mat. And I remember last time I told you, I've told you, I think like two or three times already. Next time you see me, I'm going to have changed my new mats. Well, I did. So new mats. All right, so <laughs> good eye, Michelle. Um, actually, let's go ahead and do a giveaway. I'm gonna go ahead and give it to Michelle B. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure that's Michelle Betancourt. I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure that's who I think it is. If that's you, Michelle B, who said new cutting uh, mat, go ahead and send us an email at bea at craftygemini.com and tell us, hey, I'm Michelle B. I was the one that called it out that Vanessa had the new cutting mat, and we're gonna send you this little bundle. It is a um, different fat quarters of fabrics in here with a spool of variegated Wonderfilk uh, Tutti thread, which is their 100% double gas cotton, Egyptian cotton thread. And it's like in these different shades of pinks and plums and purples. So we're gonna go ahead and mail you out one of these little fabric and thread bundles, Michelle B, so shout out to you. I'll go ahead and do another giveaway at the end for another bundle just like that. So if you want to get in on your chance for that, stick around. All right, so I got these two of each, two light, two dark at four and seven eighths inches. I have a center square at four and a half inches. And then I have two strips here that measure two and a half by 19 inches. So the first thing I'm gonna do is piece these guys together. And the reason I'm doing them like this is because I'm gonna sew the two strips together, press that seam down the middle, right? And then I'm gonna sub cut it into the units that I need to complete my block, okay? So for the sewing machine, we all know how this works, right? One on top of the other, pretty sides touching. For something like this, I'm not even gonna bother to pin, but you can. And then let's grab our handy dandy Juki LB5020, which we still have a couple in stock. I did video reviews, unboxing on this machine. It's a great beginner or travel machine just because it's lightweight. That's why I bought it so that I can put it right here on the table for y'all when we're working with, um, or on Whip Wednesdays or Flash Sale Fridays. I just wanna make sure I can. Okay, I think that's okay there. Now for this machine, I need to, and like on most machines probably, you need to go ahead and either uh, move your needle position or press a button or whatever you gotta do to make sure that you're sewing quarter of an inch seam allowance. And I am a very scant quarter inch uh, sewer, or quilter I should say. All right, so I'm gonna move my needle position because the center position is way too big of a seam allowance if I follow the edge of my presser foot here. So let's go ahead and adjust. We'll leave the stitch length where it is, but I'm going to bump up. And so this, what I'm doing here is basically adjusting the stitch width, right? I've selected a straight stitch, but because on a straight stitch, we don't have a width, on some machines, it will allow you that if you do mess with the width, it'll just keep moving your needle position over. So it'll scoot the needle over to the right or to the left, okay? So for me, when I go up, it moves it over to the right, and I'm looking I think 6.5 gives me scant enough quarter inch seam there. All right, so I'm gonna stitch down this seam real quick. I'm gonna give it a good press to set my stitches, of course, and then we'll press it to one side. To the dark side, right? Which is funny because since I'm sewing this to a light blue fabric, we established that the yellowy fabric next to the darker teal print was the light. But you'll see what happens here. Let me make sure I have this stopping with the needle down so I can adjust since I have no pins here. Let me finish stitching this up and then you'll see that the yellow, because now it's um, being sewn onto or whatever next to the light blue fabric, it's actually placed as the dark in this fabric combination. So it's amazing, right? To see how colors and fabrics and prints 
look based on which fabric they're sewn next to or worked in combination with. So let me pop in here. I just want to make sure I keep the chat coming up. Oh my goodness. So much, so much. Karen says she loves her juki. Girl, I love all my jukis. Uh, <laughs> oh, Anabel says Puerto Rico says hello, Vanessa. Saludos, Puerto Rico. My peeps, I still have a bunch of cousins that live in Puerto Rico. All right, so we're going to press this real quick. And if you need a little mini DIY ironing board, do a search on YouTube for mini ironing board DIY. And I have a tutorial that I did years ago. This is a slightly bigger size, but I definitely have um, smaller ones. Okay, you can make them in a bunch of sizes. Let me slide that over. Okay, so I've pressed it first to set my stitches, and that's a nice scant, scant quarter inch. I prefer to sew scant quarter inches uh, and then trim, you know, after versus using a really chunky seam allowance and then being short because you can always trim fabric off, but you can't really add it back on without having to take out the seam and doing all that. All right, so there's that unit. I'm going to scoot this over. Okay. So now let me go ahead. I'm going to cut these. I'm going to like sub cut them down into four and a half inch chunks. So they match up pretty good on the end. So there's no trimming that I have to do there. Now I'm just going to come here. Okay. So what I like to do, I'm right handed. Okay. So I just take my ruler and I find this corner that has a one and a one. So I'm counting up this way and up this way. So if I'm cutting just an increment here, four and a half inches, and I'll scoot this up, four and a half inches, I'm gonna put the four and a half here so that the zero point is where I need to cut. So if four and a half is right there, I line everything up, and then I can just take my rotary cutter and cut the first chunk. And I can already tell that this, because my seam allowance is so scant, this um, is a little bit it's no, it's pretty good. I thought it was a little bit bigger than four and a half the other direction, but it's not. Yes. So what exactly is a Ooh, what a great question. Who's asking that? Nancy Chandler is asking what exactly is a quarter, a scant quarter inch. This is a fabulous question. I feel like us quilters, we just throw it around. Scant just means like barely, like almost the quarter inch. Okay. So if you use and this is, I've done videos on this on my YouTube channel where I don't recommend quarter inch piecing feet because I find that from where the needle position is to the edge of the presser foot, if you do an exact quarter inch, by the time we press this back, okay. And we account for the thickness of the thread. It's surprisingly enough eating into the seam allowance, meaning it's making it bigger. Like you measured a quarter inch, then by the time you fold it and press it and account for the thread itself, now if you measure it after the fact, it's bigger than a quarter of an inch. So we prefer, a lot of us do, not everybody, but a lot of us prefer to sew a scant, so a skinnier quarter of an inch, so that then when you press the seam and fold it back, accounting for that fold in the fabric when you pressed it and the thickness of the thread, then after it's sewn and pressed, it is exactly a quarter inch. Does that make sense? And so by a little bit less than a quarter inch, I just mean like a couple of threads of fabric. You know how when you grab uh, the quilting fabric, you can see how it frays? It's just like a few threads less than a quarter of an inch, if that makes sense. So not quite half of it, because then you're like really narrow and using an eighth of an inch seam allowance. That's a little much, but you don't want to be like exactly at a quarter inch or on the chunky side of a quarter inch because that compounds and adds up across all your seams. And if you have a patchwork quilt that has a ton of different seams, you're going to be way short when you get across that row. Okay. So that's what a scant quarter inch is. It's a little bit narrower, two or three threads or so narrower than a, a proper quarter inch. And that's, I have a video on like tips for sewing a, a quarter inch seam allowance on my YouTube channel that y'all can do a quick uh, Google search for. Anytime that you want to find videos that I've done, all you have to do is type in the words crafty Gemini and then follow that with whatever keywords you're looking for. So crafty Gemini, and then look up, um, quarter inch seam allowance, crafty Gemini, scant quarter inch, like whatever, those kinds of things. Okay. That's three and I need one more. So right here. 
Okay, so this is scrap and I have those four pieces. Okay, let me see. Now I need to prep my half square triangles. Now HSTs, as you'll often see them written on the internet, on blogs, on patterns, are just what uh, is made up of usually. There's a bunch of different techniques that you can use. I started off like this, what, 13, 14 years ago, and I just find that I like to cut and it's just one of my preferred methods for doing the half square triangle and sewing straight. But I know that there's a lot of other methods uh, out there as well. So what I did here is I cut squares, one dark and one light, that measure four and seven eighths inches square. Four and seven eighths, okay? If we notice, these were cut down to four and a half by four and a half. And I mentioned previously that the center square needs to measure four and a half inches square also. So after we make our half square triangles from these pieces, they also need to measure four and a half inches square, okay? So if we start off with four and seven eighths, right? Four and seven eighths is bigger than four and a half because these need to be sewn together and that's what's gonna eat up that extra little bit and then you can trim them down to be exactly the size we need, which is four and a half square. All right, so I'm gonna put one on top of the other, pretty sides touching. And for this, I usually do use a pin. And you can just put the pin anywhere. So if I'm going to draw the diagonal from here to here, because I'll show you what the half square triangle is if you're new to quilting, um, after we like as we're making it, so you can see the visual of what it means. It's kind of a weird name for it though. It's like half square triangle. It's more like a, I don't know, a square sliced in half made up of two fabrics that then give you two triangles that measure a square. All right, so look at me with this rotary cutter. Ooh, y'all, this is dangerous. I cannot have a rotary cutter. I was about to slice it open. Uh, we need to grab, and I'm gonna grab a pencil for now, just because the, the white air erasable marker that I was gonna show you is on dark fabric, so I'll do it on the next one. But here, I'm gonna use just a regular pencil that's clearly not been sharpened. This looks like something my kids were using. And I'm going to place my ruler so that I can connect a diagonal line from here to here. And I'm just gonna trace the edge of my ruler to create that diagonal line here. Whoop. Okay, that's one. You can leave it like that. If it's nicely starched, it's not really gonna move on you. Otherwise, you could put another pin on this edge here. And then I'm gonna do the same thing to this one. Oh, the back of this fabric is not really that dark. So what I was gonna show y'all with, with that pen is not really gonna show up because the fabric's not dark, but I'll show you later maybe on, a, on the dark side of this. So I need to do this, and for this I'm gonna grab a darker, let me grab this blue marker, maybe. I think this will show up. Again, same thing, you draw the line on the diagonal, then we sew, then we cut. So do not cut first. Now we need to sew two seam lines, okay? So let me see if I can break down the visual for you here if you're new to half square triangles. We put two squares together, and from the two squares, it will yield us, after we go through the steps of making it, two half square triangle units, okay? So we'll still get two squares, but they're going to be made up of both fabrics, all right? So look what happens. If we have this line here, we're gonna sew to the left of that diagonal line, and then we're also gonna sew to the right of the diagonal line, again, using that scant quarter inch seam allowance, okay? So when we stitch here, then we'll cut on the line that we drew, and you'll see what that block is going to be like after it's pressed, like this. And it's still a square, right? But it's made up now of half and half of each of the two fabrics that I started with, and that's a half square triangle, okay? And then the other side is gonna be the identical thing, all right? So let me go ahead and sew my scant quarter inch seam allowances. Remember, it's on both sides. Where's my foot pedal? It slipped away, here you go. Quarter inch, so. The easiest way is to start to the left because if you're using your, uh, your, the edge of your presser foot as your guide, I'm just gonna set the edge of my presser foot on the line, like following the line that I drew. Okay, I'm gonna start there. And I'm just gonna follow across. Okay, I'll actually I'll leave that one there and I'm just gonna feed the next one in. Do the same thing to the other. So the first line I did of stitching is to the left of that uh, diagonally drawn line. Now, to do the other side, you'll see that if you try to feed it in, whoops, this way, if you try to feed it in, it's now confusing for you to see how you can get the exact distance this way because you can't line it up with the other edge of the foot. If you do that, the needle is way over. That's gonna be like even bigger than half of an inch, okay? So instead, after we fed it through that way, we're gonna flip the whole thing and do the same exact thing that we did before. 
all right? So if you had a bunch of half square triangles, this is how you would do it. Just feed them in and then at the end, flip the whole thing over and you'll see that it's positioned uh, in the same way that we just ran it through. So again, I'm gonna sew. My presser foot is lined up with the diagonal line. Now I am a big starcher. Go ahead and let me know in the comments below. If you're a quilter, let me know if you are a starcher or a non-starcher. There are like two really um, controversial <laughs> groups of quilters when it comes to this issue of whether to starch or not to starch. For me, I tend to be really rough with my fabric and really fast. So the more I can kind of stabilize the fabric and allow it to not move as much on me, whether while I'm, while I'm sewing or seriously, seriously, where's my bobbin thread? Wow. Y'all, it happened to me. I definitely ran out of bobbin thread. It happens to all of us, doesn't it? Let me go ahead and <laughs> wind myself a little more thread on here. Oh man, at least I was just on, on one block, right? Raise your hand out there if that's ever happened to you at like the end of piecing a super long row of a quilt or uh, piecing together like two and a half inch uh, strips of fabric where you're like going and going and making binding and then you realize, oh my gosh, I've gone 30 feet and I haven't had any bobbin in there. That sucks. All right, so I'm winding a bobbin real quick so I can stitch this back up. But yeah, I was saying, what was I talking about? Starchers and non-starchers. I like to have my fabric as crisp, as stable as possible because I tend to just kind of like be super rough with everything and really fast. And I find that when I don't starch, it just moves on me way more than I would like. And then I just get frustrated and then I don't want to work with it, right? So when I starch, and, and I'm somebody who actually enjoys the pressing part, not everybody does, but you know, if you're just pressing your fabric, it's part of the prep work, right? Those of you that love to pre-wash, especially if you pre-wash, because if you pre-wash the fabric, which I don't, um, if you pre-wash your fabric, you, um, like for quilting, then it's probably gonna come out all wrinkly, right? From the washer and dryer. And then, oh, what did I do? Oh no, I tangled it. Let me put it through the automatic needle threader so I don't have to manually do it. There we go. All right, so let me bring my bobbin thread up. There we are. Get all my stuff set up. And no more bobbin chicken. I definitely won't run out of bobbin sewing one quilt block, y'all. So I'll be good for the rest of this. Okay, so I was saying, if you pre-wash your fabric, you're getting rid of all the sizing that's in it from the manufacturer. So it's gonna be even more soft and drapey and pliable, which is, for me, not what I want when I'm quilting. And I'm cutting a lot and piecing and patchwork and pressing and all that. Uh-uh, I want my stuff to be nice and crisp. Say what? Oh, I'm sorry. All right, let me go this way. All right, so I think now we're good. So let's uh, show you how these half square triangles turned out because once you have those two lines of stitching done on each side of that diagonal line that, remember, so the trickiest part of those half square triangles is that a lot of people, when you first start off, you think that you need to stitch on the line that you drew. You don't, that's just to signify what the measurement needs to be to the left and to the right of this um, seam allowance. So first I'm gonna give it a little press because sometimes those stitches can, um, you know, since we were going in two different directions, sometimes you end up with little ripples. All right. Now we're gonna take our ruler and now we cut on the line that we drew. So that's what separates them. So because the stitches are to the left and to the right of the diagonal line, that's holding your fabric layers together. The rest is gonna get chopped. So we're gonna press these next, but you can see that's one half square triangle and two half square triangles. So I like this method one because I mentioned earlier, I don't mind the cutting and the sewing, but you get no waste, right? If you cut the pieces exactly and you sew exactly and you cut exactly, you get no waste. So there are some other methods out there of making half square triangles. Some of them have more waste than others. It's up to you. But if you like this kind of shape, you can do some more research and find some other methods, you know, and some fun ways. There are so many different quilts and variations that you can create with half square triangles, it's great. So notice what I did. We had pressed them flat first, 
Okay, now I'm going to press it open and to the dark. So I'm just pressing towards the darker fabric. Same thing here. And when I say pressing towards the darker fabric, it's the seam allowance behind here that I'm pressing in that direction. Okay. So now from those two squares, we end, or four squares, right? Two and two, we ended up with four half square triangles. So no waste. Only waste is going to be now when I trim these guys up. Because again, remember, these need to measure four and a half inches. So depending on how scant or how chunky your quarter inch uh, seam was, you may need to trim or you may need to hope that you didn't sew as narrow, right? But you can't add fabric to it. So let's have a look and see. First, you can chop off the dog ears. And the dog ears, if you subscribe to my email newsletter, you see that the Crafty Gemini newsletter is called the Dog Ears Newsletter. And what a dog ear is, if you've ever wondered, is the little triangular bits that stick out in patchwork pieces when we sew angles like triangles and stuff together, like this, okay? So those are called dog ears in quilting. And some people actually save those. I don't need any more bits of anything around here. So... Okay, so that's to get rid of those guys. Okay, and now there's some cool rulers out there too that you can use to trim up half square triangles. I am just going to, ooh, girl, you're good. Um, I'm just gonna line this up. If you notice, the ruler that I'm using here has a diagonal black line. Now, not all ruler manufacturers will have these lines on them, but if you do, you can check and see and run it down to like the four and a half inch on one corner. I'm running the black line out across the diagonal, and then I know that everything is centered, and I can basically trim away any little bit of excess that I have on the top and here. The thing with half square triangles is that you cannot just like oh, it's a little bit bigger on one side and think that you can hack off a chunk on one side because this should go from diagonal to diagonal. So if I were to chop off a piece here, here the, the two fabrics will match up right on the corner, but here I won't have a proper point. One of the fabrics will be wider and the other one narrower because you still have to maintain the exact diagonal when you're trimming. Does that make sense? Because I know I get that a lot with beginners. They're just like, oh, mine's a little bit bigger. And they literally will just put the ruler on one side and hack off what they can. But you can't do that because you have a diagonal line. It's now directional, right? So you need to balance off the difference. So right here, four and a half, four and a half. And there's really nothing for me to cut off here. It's just like these little bits, okay? But see what happens? I at least have a little something that I can trim off because I sewed that scant quarter inch. If you sew a chunky quarter inch, you're gonna be short. There's no way around it, you know? They're not gonna measure what they need to. So that's why a lot of people shy away too from quilting because they're like, oh, the seam allowances are too small. They have to be so precise. But there's always tools to use and things that you can do and practice to make everything uh, work for you so that you can get the accurate patchwork. And you saw that, how scant, I sewed scant, and I, I'm usually really on the scant side. And look at that, they're like perfect. I only had to trim off that one bit from this whole square. So I'm telling you, if you get too close to quarter of an inch, when you flip it and turn it out and all, it's going to be too small. Let me turn it so that di the, the diagonal line can be matched up with my ruler. And see, I love cutting. Okay, let's take a moment right now, whether you're watching me on Facebook or YouTube, leave me a comment and let me know what is your favorite part of the quilt making process if you're a quilter. Do you like uh, choosing fabrics? Let's go through the steps. Choosing fabrics. Do you like uh, cutting the fabrics? Like the prep work, the pre-washing, the starching, the cutting? Uh, do you like piecing your Patrick pieces? Uh, do you like quilting? And do you like binding? Which one of those is your favorite uh, step in the process? Now mine, and every time I mention this, people are super surprised, but it is the cutting. So having numbers and measurements in my head and applying them here and constantly cutting, 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 cutting is my most favorite part of quilting. So if that's not for you, you know, if that's like your least favorite part of the quilt making process, then definitely make sure you sew a scant quarter inch here because otherwise you're gonna be off. And then you're going to get frustrated having to trim everything up. Questions? All right. Oh, they are responding to my question. Ooh, Heather Pang says she loves picking out the fabrics and planning the process. Girl, I find like that can take longer than making the whole quilt. Am I right or am I right? 
that can um, often take, I need to trim a little bit off this yellow, but I still want to maintain the diagonal. So I just moved everything around so I can see four and a half, four and a half. And this yellow one, I can shave a little off this end. So that's perfect there. Just remember that when you are trimming something like this, make sure that the diagonal points are exactly where they are. Don't just cut from one side or the other. All right, so my line is in the center, four and a half and four and a half. I can stand to shave a little here, that little bit, which is so funny because I'm looking at this like I'm actually still trimming down and I sewed such a scant quarter inch. So once you do an experiment like this, you'll be like, oh, I see why. When I sew a quarter inch, a regular quarter inch, it doesn't turn out. All right, so now everything I have here, all my pieces. So look, that's our waist from four blocks. Not bad. All right, so we have, let me get this junk out the way. <laughs> all right. Let's see. Uh, Jen says, Vanessa, you must be like me. Oh, I lost it. Oh, she says, you must be like me. I see no need for a cutting machine. I'd rather do it myself because I enjoy it so much. Absolutely. When I have used um, like a die cutting machine, you know, it's not one where you're cutting each patchwork piece out. It's the ones where you're cutting out like a ton of pieces at the same time. Like for example, when I was prepping for my quilt cruise uh, earlier this year in February, we cut over 15,000 patchwork pieces because we kit the, our, the quilt that we made. We put it into a kit for all uh, 60 of our students. And so there, for sure, I was going to be cutting uh, with the die cutting machine. But for my quilts, no way. I love it. I love cutting. And just there's something soothing for me about like three and one eighth and four and seven eighths. And just keeping like these random cuts of fabric numbers in my head. I love it. I know a lot of people really hate it, but... <laughs> But it's funny because my least favorite part is actually piecing, <laughs> which a lot of you out there probably love. Okay, so let me pull this up real quick so that I can remind myself of how I need to orient this stuff. Okay, so here's my center. So all these units now must measure four and a half inches square in order for everything to come together easily and evenly, okay? Center square here. I don't even know what this block is gonna look like, y'all, because I was just using up scraps that I had. So I'm gonna go like this. I'm going to go like this, but I need some more pillow covers and I like funky stuff. So now these ones go here, right? So a, a regular churn dash block would have just like solid, 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 you know, like uh, one full square, but instead I pieced together these ones. Oh, I kind of like it. Look how cute. And that's if I put the light ones going in towards the center. Let's see what it looks like if we go like this. And this is what I love, even though they're basic, simple blocks. I mean, we have triangles here, but it wasn't like a hard triangle, right? We just sewed along the diagonal. So this is a little bit different. I kind of like the other way better because I feel like this is way too much yellow and these are kind of just like floating off into the distance. So let's go ahead and do this. And of course you could just swap two in one direction and leave the other two the other way. But I think this is what I'm going to do for mine. Funky. I like it. Who likes it? Do y'all like that? I kind of like it. it. looks good. And so you see the contrast that we get, right? Whereas in the corner blocks, the yellow plays as the light and the teal fabric plays as the dark. Then when you have the one block over, the yellow plays as the dark and the light blue plays as the light. So you kind of get this cool vibe going across the whole thing with lights and darks in different places. Awesome. Oh, quilting, how I love you. Okay. So now, ooh, Jerlene says, I love your hair. Thank you. I just let it down from a wrap, but it is, look how light and puffy. And some of you have commented that my hair is so long. My hair grows super quick and I have not had it cut since March. So yes, it is going to be super long. Okay, let's see. Uh, yeah, some people like it the other way better. I like it this way, so I'm going to piece it this way. All right, so let me scoot over. And this is another tip for sure. Lay out everything. If you've ever heard quilters talk about a design wall, that's what we do when we throw a big chunk of like batting or flannel back. Um, table cover on the wall, you know, and that way you stick them up. That way you can kind of step back and look, do I like the way the things look, especially when you're doing multiple blocks. This is kind of easy, but now I'm going to start sewing across here. Okay. One, two, three. Oh, we're making good time. Awesome. All right. So, oh, and you know what? I just going to show one more thing. I have them 
put like this, right? So that the seam across here is going horizontally. But remember, these four are also uh, four and a half inches square, right? So instead of just going like this or like this, we could also go like this, which I probably am not going to like this, but you know what I mean? Like you could play around with it in different directions. I don't know. Like this, like that. There's so many different variations, right? And depending on the fabrics that you choose, your may, yours may look totally different than mine. So say we did something like that, then I could put these guys, then obviously this is not a churn dash block, but I'm just showing you how many simple, or how many different ways from such a simple block. See, that's something else, a different variation. Obviously, if I would have used a third fabric here and here instead of more yellow, it would look even more different. But let's go back. Points to the center points to the center and light blue to the center is how I prefer it for this one. All right, so I'm gonna grab these two. And so for beginners, what I suggest is that you do it like this, like you grab one square, sew it, put it back. <laughs> grab another one, sew it, put it back. Otherwise, if you start messing up, you won't remember what goes where. And I also use another method for piecing blocks together. which is actually like this. I may do it. Y'all are going to ask me questions, but it's going to be hard to explain. If you're in my quilt club from last year, then you know what I'm talking about. All right. And this is a method I often use when I'm feeling my laziest because I can piece an entire quilt top without getting up from the sewing machine. <laughs> put my needle down and I can see my quarter inches super scant super scant y'all super super scant all right I'm gonna grab the one that's missing from this top block keep these in the correct orientation I'm gonna stitch this one to it and I'm not using pins because I don't often use pins, especially for patchwork. All the units are so small. They do come together to make something bigger, right? But, oh, they're super small. Sorry, sorry. I forgot about scooting this a little bit more over. Is that okay there? Okay. So I stop there. This next one, I need to grab this one, put it here. And this is basically like I have the template layout in my head so I am visually seeing what needs to come next so that it can all be in line and you'll see what happens and you see how I haven't had to take anything out of the machine I haven't put pins I don't have to do anything I'll show you what it looks like now after I sew this one to it And this is great because we haven't really had any uh, points to match at all. We will when we start to put these together because really what this all comes down to is like a nine patch, right? We have three blocks across by three blocks down. All right, so now I'm just going to open this up to show you. I normally would not do this. I would just keep sewing. But see? And they're all held together. Woo! So now we know what we need to do, right? And you can stop and press, but this is kind of an assembly line style method of doing things. Now I'm just gonna go like this and like this. And because I chain piece these together as I was sewing, they're already connected at these intersections. So it makes it super easy for me to put this here and then I'll flip this back and then I'll do the same thing to this one and bam, we have a whole block. Let me get rid of these tails that are driving me nuts. So, okay. So here and here, and notice I don't even put pins in the intersections, y'all, because they're held together, they're not really going anywhere, and the last little bit of finagling I need to do, I can do with my fingertips as I get this, or as I get to this part in the sewing machine. So let me know in the comments if any of you use that kind of um, web method to piece your stuff together. All right. Okay, cool. All right, let me stitch this up. So as I come up to this intersection here, and I just want to make sure my arm's not in the way. Okay. Oh, I can't see where the machine is. There. Okay. So now I'm going to bring this here to match up 
where it needs to. And I just hold it at the intersection. One seam allowance is going one way and the other going the other way. Boom. I'm, I'm over here lying like I did a great job, but we'll only find out if it really turned out once we press this back, right? But that's the idea. I hold it with the intersection, seam allowance, one going one way, one going the other. Still matching up raw edges and sew till you get past the next intersection. Let me just double check this guy. Yep. I like my perfect points, y'all. So that's what I'm aiming for. And then here and here. And that matches up pretty good. So okay. Now we have one more row and then we'll give it all a good press. So this one like this. And of course, I mean, one block seems like it takes a little bit, but if you did this assembly line style with a bunch of blocks, it would fly. Okay, those, make sure they're matching. <laughs> Portia says she uses this method too, but not as good as me. It just takes practice. The more quilts you make like this, the quicker and better you'll get. And really, it all comes down to your fingertips. You know, it's not so much like, oh, a technique that I read in a book or something that I saw or something that I learned in a class. The hands-on practice of it is really what's going to help you get better, faster, quicker. I mean, and, and I am fast at things, but I'm still a perfectionist. So it's like I end up kind of getting that balance of like, it turns out looking good, but I'm fast. Not everybody likes to be fast. You know, there's this, this is like knitting for me or even crochet. It's so much slower than sewing, right? But I still like them too, even though I'm extra hyper and super fast. So just because I'm doing stuff fast doesn't mean that that's the goal, right? The goal is to enjoy what you're doing first and foremost. But if you're like me and you like to go fast and you feel like, okay, let's see how much I, sometimes, you know, I'm a little wild. I'd be timing myself. How long is it going to take me to make this block? Let me see if I can make it 27 seconds faster than the last one. Like I play mind games and challenges with myself because that's how I am. But if you just like to take your sweet time and enjoy every stitch, that's fine too. I'd like to hand quilt some things because of that too. It's just, it forces me to slow down. I'm never going to choose it if there's a quicker option, but if I like the way that it looks, I will make myself slow down to do it like knitting. I fought uh, liking knitting for so, so long. Cause I'm like, crochet is so much faster. But then I start looking at more knitted projects like hand knit projects. And I'm like, you just cannot get the same stitch definition that you can with knitting. So I was like, okay, girl, you're going to have to suck it up and knit. And now I'm like obsessed with knitting. Okay. So here's my block. It looks a hot mess, right? because we have not pressed anything. You see what I was doing? I started pulling on it. Don't pull, just trim. <laughs> okay, let's give it a good press. So we press flat, flat along these seams first. I'm gonna press this way on this guy. I like this block, it's super funky. I'm glad I chose this. Okay, so, I usually, especially when I teach, I always say like after we sew a seam, we, we press a seam, like when I teach kids or beginners, just to get them into the habit of pressing. But you can see that if you do something like this, not pressing until the end is not really going to affect anything. Like you still can do that. Oh, that's crispy. How cute is that? I really like this. And then the idea is that you should still have, look at this, this seam. Oh, this is where the bobbin died. The last little bit. I, I picked up at the bottom of that stitch seam or at the seam that, that I did have bobbin thread for and I didn't go all the way to the beginning, but I can stitch that back up. Actually, let me do it now because it's bothering me. But what I was going to say was, I don't remember now. Let me just stitch this up real quick. Oh, that when now, after you press it, I'm going to have a look at the ends. We'll look at my points. Let me back stitch to start on there and then stitch off the edge. Okay. So let's have a look at the points and then we're going to look at the edge because that seam, uh, seam allowance that we talked about at the beginning, like that quarter of an inch seam allowance, you'll see how it affects you here. Like th the block might look amazing right here, but if you don't have a quarter of an inch extra here from where the point of this teal fabric is to the edge of the yellow, what happens is that if you don't have that extra bit of fabric there, Whatever we sew next to this, whether it's another block, a border, whatever it is, would then eat up the point of this triangle. 
I mean, and that's still fine, but obviously that's not the goal. In quilting, we want everything to look like crisp. But you see how I have a little bit of fabric there? My scant quarter inch of yellow, same thing here. You should have it on each end, especially of where you have triangular points. Make sense? So a little there, a little there, a little there. So, and you saw how scant I sold those, those seam allowances. If you go bigger, chances are that your blocks will probably end up being too small and you won't have this bit here to accommodate the seam allowances that come next based on whatever you're going to add to your block. I'm kind of obsessed with this little block. I'm definitely going to add some borders to it to make it into a larger block for a pillow cover. Let's go ahead and have a measure, okay? If these blocks started off at four and a half inches, each one, remember four and a half, four and a half, four and a half, and we piece them all together, I suppose this should end up being a 12 and a half inch block when it's a loose block. It's what we call in quilting, like when it's finished, it'll be 12 inches. So you'll see how mine is gonna be bigger. And I can always guarantee that because I use a scant quarter inch seam. So if I measure from there to here, mine measures 12 and 5 eighths. So it's an eighth of an inch bigger than 12 and a half. And if I measure this way, same thing. 12, uh, 12 and 5 eighths, this one is like a little bit closer to 12 and 3 quarters. Okay, now if I sew that same scant quarter inch seam allowance across all my blocks, it doesn't matter that the block doesn't measure exactly 12 and a half by 12 and a half, okay? As long as all my blocks measure like this, 12 and 5 eighths by about 12 and 5 eighths, because I can see this needs to be trimmed just a little bit off. So if my, all my blocks measure 12 and 5 eighths and 12 and 5 eighths, then it doesn't matter that it's not 12 and a half like the pattern might have said, because guess what? The key in quilting for Patrick pieces is consistency. So if you do sew chunky quarter of an inch seam allowances and you're fine with how your blocks turn out, as long as all of them are the same, it's gonna be consistent across the board, okay? So that's just kind of like an intro to how our seam allowances affect our patchwork. <laughs> but don't get too frustrated if it doesn't come out perfectly, you know? All right, let's see. Mary Grace says she assembles her quilts the same way. Uh, Maria says she also uses that chain piecing method in quilting. Uh, oh yeah, Rambo is asking, are you using a scant quarter inch here too? So the key is to sew the exact scant, like whatever your quarter inch seam allowance, scant or not, whatever you're, you decide to use and you're okay with, use that exact same seam allowance across all your pieces, okay? All right. Oh, Diana says, I've never pieced. I tried once and they didn't match, LOL. I need to try again. You do, and so that's kind of how I kind of like to walk you through for short demos like this at least, you know, to kind of walk you through where my mind is, how I think of things, how I uh, approach things so that you understand how, how it affects things. Because I mean, this is fabric at the end of the day. If you pull it too hard in one direction, it's gonna throw the measurement all kinds of off, all right? So that's kind of another reason why I like to starch because I like my stuff to be crisp. It's like, I know you're gonna move on me. It's gonna get a little bit distorted, but with that layer of starch, it helps me, you know, without it being super duper um, distorted and messed up. But yeah, quilting is super fun, super fun. All right, so let's switch to the other front camera. I'm gonna see if I have any other questions here that I can answer for y'all, then we'll do a giveaway, and then we'll call it a night. Okay, oh, this is fun. I can scroll through all the comments. All right, let's see. Jan says, I don't think I would be able to keep sewing without ironing all those seams. And that's fine too. I'm like that sometimes depending on the project. If it's a whole entire quilt, there's no way. I'd have to stop and press some seams. Uh, but for one little block, I I'll deal with it. <laughs> but I feel you on that, Jan. Uh, let's see. Juliana says, she bought a pre-cut kit and she's going to use my method. Awesome. Definitely. Give it a try. Let's see. All right, so take a quick moment to uh, give this video, this demo, a thumbs up. If you're on Facebook, give it a thumbs up and click the share button and tell your friends. You know, we're here live every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern and Fridays at 7 p.m. Eastern time on both Crafty Gemini Facebook page and the YouTube channel. So you can check me out on whichever platform you prefer. Now, a heads up next Wednesday, we will not have a whip Wednesday because I will not be here. So uh, next Friday, though, we will be back, okay? Uh, yeah, so this is a variation on a churn, a churn dash block. You can do a search for that. And I actually have a tutorial for a churn dash block um, that I did years ago on my YouTube channel. And I want to say it doesn't have the split here. It's just like the solid square. I can't recall exactly, but I'm pretty sure that that's how it goes. Uh, let's see. 
All right, Jenna says it's gonna make a great pillow. She just mailed out nine pillows today for friends for Christmas gifts. That sounds amazing and super fun. It's so cool because it's like a quick and easy home decor item that you can swap out. You know, if you make holiday themed ones, you can just put them away with the supplies of the ho that holiday, you know, and then next year bring them out and then just swap those covers for whatever you have on your couch. Um, pillows, super easy and fun. All right. Kathy says, how do you keep your iron clean after starching? So um, I have a video that I did on how to clean the, how I clean the sole plate of my iron. So again, you can do a search for that. Uh, just on YouTube, just type in Crafty Gemini clean iron and it'll pop right up for you um, on how I do it. Basically, I uh, use a wet towel and a magic eraser to clean everything off the bottom of it. But it takes a, a good bit because I use a lot of starch and it's it's not like if you were hitting a fusible, uh, what do you call that stuff, like the adhesive on fusible interfacing, that's a little bit different, right? The starch, not so bad. All right, so I see some others of you are here, like Laura says she sews and then she presses at the end. Yes, definitely. Terry says this, this would make, uh, it would be cool to use as the front of a tote bag. And that's the cool thing about like one-off blocks. Maybe you're trying to learn a new technique or you want to give half square triangles a try if you want to do that. And then you're like, well, I'm not going to make a whole quilt. What can I do with this? We had, I think our first whip Wednesday uh, where I had leftover blocks from another quilt and I did turn them into pillows for my kids and they loved them. And they were just one block and that was the pillow. They chose the fabrics for the block and I whipped those up for them. But this one is definitely going to be another one. And I I think I still have enough fabric to make some more or I'll just play around. I like a lot of color. I don't necessarily care if things match or not. I just want bright pops of color. So I feel like I'm going to do a few more with different, different scrappy fabrics. Okay. Okay. Gail says, um, the shoe fly block is like the churn dash, but with the solid square instead of the rectangles. Oh, you're right. So that's, um, there's so many names and so many thousands of quilt blocks. It's pretty insane. So like, say we took this teal fabric and where the light blue is, we use the teal fabric here. That would be, I think the same as the, the churn dash. It's just different fabrics in different positions. And then the shoe fly block. Oh my God. I've made so many quilts and so many blocks. I'm just like that big quilt that I made for your mom with the leopard print. Do you remember? <laughs> Why am I asking you? Like you would know the block. I don't know what the block is, but it was like a super sized one of these, either the shoe fly or the churn dash. And it was like super sized to 16, um, 16 or 16 and a half inches square. Super cute. Okay. Uh, Elizabeth says she makes hot pads with the blocks. That's a great idea, especially if you're trying out techniques or practicing small piecing into six or seven or eight inch blocks. That would be awesome to make uh, for hot pads or trivets, you know, quilted trivets and stuff. All right. Uh, Angel's asking, what kind of interfacing should you use to keep the shape of a pillow? So for the pillows, when I make, say, like a patchwork block like this, I will oftentimes use either a fusible, usually a fusible batting, either um, a double-sided fusible batting, which is like the Duet Fuse 2, or the light one-sided fusible batting. And they're Bozal products that I use that we carry in the shop. And that way, I, if you don't want to quilt, you don't even have to quilt. Because if you fuse this to that, it's going to give it a little bit more body than just fabric by itself and definitely more body than just having, say, um, a cotton woven interfacing fuse to the back of it. It's a little bit stiffer than that. And it just feels like more plump, which I like that kind of batting buffer between the fabric and then the pillow. So that's usually what I would use. But I mean, you can make a pillow cover just with the fabric like that, too. <clears throat> and, you know, maybe an envelope pillow, uh, envelope pillow back uh, on the back. You don't even have to use interfacing in that case because you also have to think it's going over a pillow. So the, the soft cushiony part of the pillow is going to be supporting it as well. All right. Let's see. Oh, PJ says such a relaxing time watching you after a busy week. Thanks for sharing your time with us. Well, thank you for tuning in. We are going to go. I'm going to, because I have all the chat here. I'm just going to like swipe this thing down and see where my finger lands. Maybe it shows up there. Well, we'll do it. I'm going to go through here through all the comments and boom, Laurel Miller, Laurel Miller on YouTube. You are the giveaway winner. So we um, are going to mail you off this bundle of fat quarters with a spool of barricaded blue, uh, wonderful 2T thread. It's hundred percent Egyptian cotton. And then you get a bunch of fat quarters in there. All right, so make sure that you email us at bea at craftygemini.com and just tell me, hey, uh, this is Laurel Miller. I won the YouTube giveaway uh, on tonight's Flash Sale Friday, okay? All right, everybody, thank you for tuning in. 
I will be back next Friday. So remember, no Whip Wednesday coming up this week. I won't be here for Whip Wednesday. Thanks to everybody who got uh, a flash sale tonight. And those of you that have added your email to the wait list, when we restock those, you will automatically get a notification letting you know that they've been restocked so you can head over to the site and place your order. Thanks to everybody who continues to support us online with our little um, home family business that we run here. We definitely appreciate it. I hope you have a great, great weekend that you get some time to relax a little bit and do something that you enjoy, like sewing, quilting, crafting, crochet, knitting, machine knitting, whatever it is. I always try to do all of them, <laughs> even though I don't have all the time. But that is that, and I hope to see you all uh, next week. Have a great weekend, and thanks for tuning in.